Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message this morning is When Jesus Sleeps, and I'll be preaching from Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 35. And this is part of a three-part series I've put together called Finding Your Way Back to Jesus. I want to welcome our television audience in Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky. I also want to welcome our YouTube audience, and I want to say a special hello to my friend Obedullah Izat, who watches from Pakistan. You know, many people lose their way following Jesus for different reasons. And my intent in these three messages is not to call anyone out, no. It's not to judge anyone, no, far from it. My intent is for us to consider why a person might lose their walk with Jesus. And if that person is listening to persuade you to find your way back to him. The phrase, finding your way back, will make some of my reformed friends cringe, but I really couldn't care less what they think. Now, did I just say that or did God make me say that? I'll leave that to my reformed friends to debate. A few of you get that. So here we go, finding your way back to Jesus. Today's message has two points, and here they are. The disciples expected smooth sailing, and second, the disciples could have jumped ship but did not. Let's say our confession together. If you've never been here or heard this before, you can just listen while we say our confession together. I believe the Bible. Believe it is the Word of God. Every word of God is true. If the Bible says something that disagrees with my attitudes, my beliefs, my opinions, or my traditions, I will change with the power of the Holy Spirit. And while we're at it, let's say our second confession. God can do whatever he wants. Whenever he wants. Wherever he wants. With whomever he wants. For as long as he wants. Without anyone's permission. That's the God I serve. How about you? First, I want you to see that the disciples expected smooth sailing. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. The scripture says that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. I'll stop right there and speak for a little bit. Jesus had been teaching Lakeside. It was a great location, lots of room for growing crowds, probably good acoustics. And on this particular day, he had preached what would become one of his most famous parables, the parable of the sower. I'll be speaking about that within the next couple of weeks. The people listened, but in their zeal to see more miracles, they, they gave Jesus little time to rest or a little time to eat and, they eat and they often pressed in real closely and were smothering. So Jesus asked his disciples to have a boat ready. Even Jesus needed some rest. And from the boat, a little offshore, he would preach freely as the crowd gathered on the shores of Galilee and those with boats on their own joined him in the water. And when the sun set, instead of rowing in, Jesus told them to pull up anchor and to head to the other side. And despite the growing darkness, his disciples and the other curious sailors set sail. This lake, it's called a sea, the Sea of Galilee. It's more like a lake in our standards. This sea was about... 13 miles across, not massive, but larger than a pond. And we don't know how long exactly the journey would have taken from one side to the other, but we can estimate that in an oar-propelled belt, it would happen in just a few hours on a calm night. 
and with some wind in the sails, it probably would take just a few hours. The disciples were used to this type of travel. But of course, we know the story. Almost all of us here have heard the story before. And we know that this night turned out to be neither calm nor clear. And all of a sudden, the disciples, all of them being very familiar with boat travel, being familiar with the possibility of foul weather, all of a sudden they found themselves in something they weren't expected. They knew from experience that if there was a storm, they knew that because of their experience they were prepared, they would be prepared. They knew that, that it would not be calm sailing all the time, but on this particular night everything looked fine. There were even other boats with him. There was no sign of any foul weather ahead. A 13-mile crossing in a small sea that night. No problem. Let's go. Besides, we've got Jesus aboard. We've already seen him cast out demons. We've, we've already seen him heal the sick. We, we saw him heal this man with leprosy. We saw him heal a paralyzed man. We have already seen Jesus, even though we're only in Mark chapter a four. We've already seen Jesus uh, establish, uh, challenge the religious establishment. We've already seen how popular he is. Jesus is our insurance policy on this boat. And if he's with us, we'll make it to the other side. You know, in the, in the early days of being followers of Jesus, we may have felt the same way. We felt that if Jesus was with us, it would be smooth sailing. We may have heard someone give a gospel presentation in such a way that it sounded like Jesus would just make life easy. And since, since we believe those things, we believe that a storm wouldn't be any big deal with Jesus in our boat. We believe that since Jesus had our best interests at heart, nothing, nothing bad would happen, that all would be well. And right then, at that time, when we repented of our sin and trusted Jesus with our lives, everything was fine. Just like the disciples, when they sailed out in that boat, as the sun went down, they expected smooth sailing. Next, I want you to see that the disciples could have jumped ship, but they did not. Mark chapter 4, verse 37. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. His disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? All of us know that storms will happen. We don't really question that. None of us disagree with that. The disciples knew that storms in life would happen. Some are more prepared for those storms than others. And once we've been through one storm, we will be better prepared for the next. Now listen, geographically speaking, the Sea of Galilee was an ideal, it still is an ideal location for storms, just tucked in a rift valley, the wind funnels through the surrounding hills and mountains, and combined with the temperature differences between the water and the land, atmospheric pressures, changes, and the lake's shallow depths, sudden and intense storm formations were not uncommon. And since many of the disciples were seasoned fishermen, they likely knew the water well. They likely knew the Sea of Galilee well. It would not have been the first time they experienced a storm. They would have been prepared. They would have known what to do. But all of a sudden, there was an unexpected squall. This squall, this, this sudden and intense weather phenomenon, the disciples probably did not have a lot of time to think about it before it was on top of them. But I'm sure when the clouds gathered and when the clouds blotted out the stars and the moon, they began to take precautions. Initially, they may have tried to travel faster to hasten their trip. 
to try to get to dry land before the storm hit. And when the winds picked up and the rain began to fall, they would have gauged their position. And if they were sailing, they would have taken down the sails, rolled them up and dropped anchor as the boat rocked and the water began to pour in from the rain above and the waves around them. They would have started bailing water because they knew what to do. Then at some point, somebody remembered that Jesus was in the boat. And when they had the presence of mind to look for him, they found him fast asleep. Not only was he asleep, but his head was on a cushion. This is such an interesting detail. Matthew and Luke leave that detail out, but Mark includes it. They don't mention that, uh, that Jesus had his head on a cushion, but I think it's just fascinating. Jesus was not just sleeping. He was sound asleep. He was in deep sleep. Jesus found a cushion somewhere. I picture Jesus curled up on his side in this fetal position with his mouth a bit open, drooling a little bit, sleeping soundly like a baby and snoring like a man. The wind tossed the boat from side to side. The waves began to beat against the hull. The water gathered and rose around their feet. The disciples were, were fighting for dear life. And Jesus just slept away. I want you to notice what the disciples do not ask. They do not ask, Jesus, why are you letting this storm tear this boat to pieces? They didn't even say, what's wrong with you, man? Come on, grab a bucket. In Matthew's account, they cry, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. In Luke's account, they cry, Master, Master, we're going to drown. But only in Mark's gospel, the simplest to me of the four gospels, only in Mark's gospel does he hit the nail on the head when he records the full extent of their cries. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And these men knew that the storms were the natural order of things. They had experienced them before. They knew that these kinds of storms could be deadly. They did not need to know why they were experiencing a storm, but, but, but they did not understand why Jesus, their teacher, their master, their Lord, was not doing anything about it. They didn't even really, they couldn't comprehend it. But what was most important to them is why he didn't care. They believed he didn't care. Can you imagine how the disciples felt when they saw him? Imagine how you might have felt. Perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, you have no need to imagine. Perhaps you have been in a similar situation. Perhaps you're there right now. One minute you're sailing through life. You've been sitting at the feet of Jesus. You've been listening to what he has to say. You've been reading your Bible. You've had great fellowship with, with Christian brothers and sisters. You've got great Christian music that just feeds you all the time. You're trying to be obedient and do what he says to do. You're in the boat with him going to where he told you to go. And then all of a sudden, a storm kicks up. It may just start out with a few dark clouds. There may be an unusual bump and you need to get it checked out. Maybe your son's grades have started falling. Maybe he's acting out a little more. Maybe your work is getting a little more stressful. Then it starts to rain. And then your doctor orders some tests. Your son who had the, the falling grades decides to skip school. And then your boss calls you in for an unexpected meeting. And before you know it, the wind is blowing. The water's pouring in. You have bad medical news. Relationships are falling apart. You've lost your job. The bills are piling up. Things are bad and getting worse. You're praying. You're calling out. But when you look around, Jesus seems to be nowhere to be found. Worse yet, he seems to be sleeping. 
He seems to not be hearing you. And we know the rest of the story in the scripture. I'm not even going to read it. We know that Jesus stood up. He told the wind and the waves to be quiet and still. And the storm ceased. We know that Jesus then questioned the disciples and wondered why they were afraid and why they had so little faith. But today, I just want to stop right there. I'm not going to jump to the part where the storm is over. Because for some of you, the storm is not over. For some of you today, you're in the middle of that storm. And every time you turn around, there's another bucket of pain. There's another downpour of problems or questions being thrown your way. The winds of this life are tearing you apart. And you wonder, where is this Jesus. Maybe it seems as if he's asleep on a cushion. Maybe it seems as if you are about to drown. And like the disciples, you may not question why. You probably understand that bad things happen all the time. Storms come and go, and there are often casualties, but your questions are a lot deeper than why. And your questions are a lot harder to answer. Where is Jesus when I'm struggling? Does he even care? If so, why is he not helping? If he loves me like he says he loves me, why is he not rescuing me? Does he care if I drown? And you may be asking, where is my miracle? I have a friend who asked these questions after her 20-year-old son died. I didn't know her son, but I hear that he was a great guy. He was an intelligent and hardworking uh, young man. He was artistic. And most people outside of the family did not know about his struggles. No one ever really named it. Was it depression? Was it anxiety? Was it autism? Was it uh, ADD? You know, the labels didn't really matter. And although he was a Christian, it seems like he was rarely at peace. And his mom, my friend, prayed for him since he was born. And when mental illness began to manifest itself in his life, she took him to a doctor, she took him to a counselor, and she continued to pray. She prayed for him on his good days, and she prayed for him on those really difficult days. She trusted that one day God would make it all right. And then one night her son had a huge argument with his family. And my friend prayed for her son, but he would not come in the house with her. So she prayed for his safe return as he pulled out of the drive in the car. And you know, her son never came home. He wrapped his car around a tree that night and he went to be with Jesus. And my my friend's prayers were not answered, at least not in the way that she had hoped. The storm raged. She felt like she was drowning. Where was Jesus? Why did he not come to her son's rescue? Where was her miracle? And today in her office, there's a picture of this Bible passage on her wall. Jesus is standing in the boat and his disciples are looking at him. The storm is raging on the, and on the outskirts of the picture, the light has dawned. On the outskirts of the picture, the storm is broken and the winds and the waves have died down. And this picture reminds her of two simple truths. Since Jesus is in the boat with her, one day the storm will end. And so often we we concentrate on the second truth that we forget the first. Look at the end of verse 36. It says... There were also other boats with them. (laughs) The disciples were not the only ones in the water that night. They were not the only ones fighting for their lives. They were not the only ones afraid of the storm. There were people in other boats. But listen to me. Here's your takeaway today. Please don't forget this. The only difference between their boats and the boat with the disciples is who was in the boat with them. That's the only difference. And when they woke him up from his nap, Jesus reprimanded the disciples. He wanted to know why they didn't have faith. But let's be honest, it's hard to have faith in the middle of a storm. 
And some may say the disciples should not have been afraid because Jesus told them that they were going to the other side. And if Jesus said it, then surely it would happen. And, and we know that to be true, but it's hard to think about the future when your present is falling apart. Others may say that the, the, the disciples should have just followed the example of Jesus. He was at peace, and they should have been at peace too. Yes, I mean, that's true as well, but for most of it, it's, it's a little difficult to snuggle up for a nap while we're swallowing fistfuls of water. And for me, there's something a little more basic here that can bring us some encouragement. Think about these things. If you are angry at Jesus because he did not bail you out, if you are agreed with Jesus because the storm in your life is still raging and there seems to be no end in sight, if you think that Jesus has failed you or let you down because he has not answered your prayers in the way that you thought that he would or because he does not display his power in a way that you expected, can I ask you to do me one favor and to do yourself one favor? Can you remember this? Like the sailors on the water that night so long ago, we do not have a choice as to whether or not we will experience the storm. For every single human being living on this earth, I can guarantee this. We will all face tragedy. We will all face sickness, difficult relationships, and struggles. Something or several things will happen over our lifetime that will rock us to the core. It's not always fair. It seldom, if ever, seems right. And we may be able to avoid some storms by making responsible choices, but we do not have a choice in whether or not to avoid all storms. The storms will come despite our best attempts to avoid them. Our choice is not whether we will experience the storm. Here it is. Here's the favor. Here's the favor you can do for yourself here. Our choice is whose boat we are in when it hits. That's our choice. Would you rather be in the boat with Jesus <laughs> or would you rather be in the storm alone? Jesus may seem like he's sleeping, but he is never unaware. Romans chapter 8 verse 38 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus loves us. And he does not want us to go through the storms of this life on our own. His rescue may sometimes seem untimely according to our watches, according to our calendars. We may not get the answer that we want here on this earth. We may have to wait until we get to the other side before the wind stops blowing. Sometimes he calms the storm on the outside. Sometimes he calms the storm on the inside. But his presence alone is our comfort and guide. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was an American poet and educator who wrote a famous Christmas carol. And as the American Civil War raged around him and grief and despair and questions raged within him, he too questioned God. And, and he wrote this. You'll know some of these words. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. If your expectations of Jesus were, were wrapped up in, in images of Jesus that you gained from different sources, but those, those images of Jesus do not represent the Jesus that's in the New Testament, then you've, you've had a flawed understanding of who this Jesus is. Jesus is there. He's, he's reaching out to you like Terry sang. Please, come back to Jesus. Please, don't put it off. 
be in the boat that Jesus is in. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. If you are in a storm today, can I just encourage you with these words? Don't jump ship. Stay in the boat. Keep calling out to Jesus. I promise you it's better to be in the boat with Jesus than in the storm alone. I watched a, uh, a YouTube video about a doctor who was talking about something, and he used a term that I'd never heard before. Of course, I'm not a doctor, so I, it was a new to me. But he said there's a term in the medical world called a phrase called the observed anecdotal evidence over time. In other words, doctors in their practices start observing certain patterns. And although there has not been any scientific research that's gone into many of these patterns they observe, they, they have learned that, that over time, this collection of things that they have learned from their patients, these things usually end these types of results. The observed anecdotal over, evidence over time. So I have to tell you, as a 58-year-old man, with my, these years behind me, I can tell you, that the observed, my observed, anecdotal evidence over time that I've not taken notes over, I've not made records of, but I can tell you that it's better to be in the boat with Jesus than to be out there alone. And you know what happened when you go to Mark chapter five? Mark chapter five, you find that they actually reached the other side. What do you know? <laughs> Cling to Jesus. Keep calling out to him. He did not promise that it would be an easy journey, but he promises to take us to the other side. And he always, always keeps his promises. Let's stand together. And Terry's going to lead us in our invitation hymn. We have this time in our service where people can come forward to pray. People can come forward to repent of their sin and trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. We'll have a few people waiting down front to counsel with anybody who comes forward. Call out to Jesus. Reach out to him. Don't give up. Don't jump ship. Say